I came in 1972 when the women's movement was really in its heyday. And I had uh, just recently been learning women's history myself. It was a brand new field. So I came at it from an academic perspective, but also from a very personal perspective because I was very much involved in the women's movement. Um, I had just gotten back from nine months in Europe where my husband was writing a book and I was finishing my dissertation. My field at UCSB for my, for my PhD was uh, intellectual history of the constitutional period, so very different. I'd never been particularly interested in women's history. But before we went to Europe, while I was a TA uh, in the graduate department, history department at UCSB, one of uh, my fellow graduate students, one of my sister graduate students, was working on a topic in women's history in the early 19th century. And no university was offering courses in women's history. Uh, there had been some scattered scholarly research in the field over the decades, mostly having to do with the suffrage movement. And so she said, well, we should offer a course in women's history, but there wasn't any UCSB faculty member who was ready to do that, but one of them was willing to sponsor us. And we were eight graduate students, none of us studying, except one of us studying women's history. So we divided up the field. I took the colonial period, because that had been sort of my period. We divided up the field. We each did the research in our own little portion of it. Um, we offered the course under the auspices of one of the uh, professors in the department, because graduate students, we were told, could not offer a course. And every week we met, uh, almost like our own little graduate seminar, taught the other graduate students our little portion of the field, what we had discovered in our research, chose the readings, told them how to lead the discussion sections, and gave the lectures to the big group in our own field. And that's how we learned women's history in that semester. So at that point, I was just about ready to, to hit the job market. Meanwhile, I'd gone to Europe. I was finishing my dissertation. Uh, and so I came to City College and said, you ought to offer a course in women's history. <laughs> and uh, what was timely about that was not just the women's movement, but also the whole turmoil of the 1960s with the uh, Black Power Movement, uh, the Chicano Brown Power Movements. Uh, City College had recently hired faculty in both those areas. They'd begun to introduce courses in both those areas. So time was right for something in women's history. And so I offered a, I made up a course proposal, went before the curriculum committee. And uh, then I often wondered about this because then they interviewed not just me but two other people to teach it. And I think, based on subsequent experience, that normally when somebody talks to them about teaching a course, you just, you know, the chair decides, okay, I'll hire that person. Uh, so I was wondering, well, maybe that was the first time when there was some doubts about me. And I was also known to be active in the women's movement. I'd helped establish the local chapter of the National Organization for Women. And in the spring, about the same time I was introducing this course to City College, uh, a group of women at City College invited me to be on a panel of speakers, and so we met as a panel with Jenny Weber in the English department, Barbara Crawford in the communications department. I can't remember who else was part of that panel. Uh, possibly Magdalena Torres, I don't remember. And we met at the campus center by the Chicana mural <laughs> at lunchtime and talked about women's liberation. And I could see on the fringes of the crowd various faculty members from the social science uh, division, all men, could have, you know, scouted me out. So I was known to be a feminist activist at that point, which may have been difficult for some of the members of the department. At that point, I was an adjunct for two years. So I introduced that course, I taught it the next year. I was pregnant at the time, had my baby in January. So it was my first year of teaching one course as an adjunct. Then the next year, uh, Desmond O'Neill, who later became a board member and then was teaching in the history department, decided he was going to take a year's leave of absence. And so uh, I was offered, which was a wonderful opportunity, two-thirds of a contract, because meanwhile I worked up a second course, which was called Women in the Social Revolution. And it was an interdisciplinary course, not just history, but that we, uh, I was going to bring in just the very early beginnings of research in gender studies. Psychology was beginning to pay attention to gender. Sociology was paying more attention to gender. There was lots of women's literature. So I gave an interdisciplinary course, uh, which ended up being a lot of discussion and, and a really wonderful course. 
So I was going to, uh, and I went through the curriculum committee, so I've been teaching one women's history class, now as still as an adjunct, I did just a second course, so I had a contract two-fifths time, and another young man was hired for the other three-fifths time, so we shared a contract. And then Desmond decided to retire permanently, and the job opened up. Very exciting time in the world, because uh, it's the time when uh, women were beginning to return to college. I see them or saw them then as sort of the elder, the younger sisters of the GI Bill people. They had gotten married right out of high school. Uh, their husbands had gotten a college education. They'd helped support them through college and graduate school. Their kids were now in school, sometimes in high school, and they were deciding what to do with the second half of their lives. And so they were coming back to City College. And the analogy I make is to what it was like for higher education just after World War II with all the GIs flooding into the college. So it was very invigorating for uh, classroom teachers at that point because here are women in their 40s and sometimes 50s, sometimes as early as their 30s, unsure of themselves, but bright and good writing skills and uh, so receptive to women's history, receptive to women's studies, wanting to learn more. And at the same time, the, psychology, uh, the um, counseling division was b being very sensitive to the needs of returning women students. So there was a nice kind of coalition there. So I taught the two courses in women's studies, um, then was a candidate for the full-time position when Desmond O'Neill decided he was going to retire full-time. And that was hot competition also. But I was very much aware that there had only ever been three women in the um, social science division. And at the time I came, there were no women. And I think it was a little hard for some of the other members of the division, not necessarily of the department, to swallow. So there was tough competition for it. Uh, and I felt really privileged to, uh, to get the job. We continued to have continuing stu uh, returning students. And a lot of them were men as well, taking advantage of community college education. And a lot more immigrants. Uh, who were often some of the most motivated, uh, was a change as well. There continued to be very enthusiastic women uh, taking women's history classes and not very many men. Uh, but I was just now browsing at the bookstore and was so pleased to see, first of all, um, there are almost equal numbers of men and women in the history department, not quite. And I was instrumental in the, in our, early years of getting more women into the division. By the way, that job I took in 1974, I became full-time in 1974, was the last full-time opening in the history department for the next 20 years. So I really lucked out. Uh, there's no way I was going to get a job at UCSB because my husband was on the faculty and at that point they never hired wives or spouses. Uh, also they wouldn't hire their own students, so you know my major professor was already on the staff. So this was for me a dream job, a really wonderful job. So then I was on, because women were required, when you, under affirmative action, <coughs> when you make a new hire, you uh, need to have a screening interviewing committee that has a mixture of, of genders and, and uh, ethnic groups. So I was on a number of screening and interviewing committees and uh, so could see an economist, uh, one, one economics professor retired, a woman economist was uh, employed, was hired. It happened slowly and gradually, but also in the history department. I was on the screening interviewing committee for a uh, new Western civil instructor to come in who was a woman and so forth. So yes, I do think it made a difference. Also, um, I was able to join very much with women in other departments. As I mentioned before, the, uh, the counseling department the English department already had a lot of women, and many of them were very much aware of being, uh, of teaching more about women's literature, of meeting the special needs of their women students, and by the way, the special needs of the men's students also. We had a brief period of a women's, of a women's center, uh, which I was not terribly involved with as more counseling. So I think it was about four or five years we had a women's center, a special dedicated, one of the uh, temporary buildings specially de dedicated to that. The duplicating offices later moved into it when the administration decided it wasn't needed anymore. Some of the, well, some of my colleagues in the social science division were just wonderful mentors for me. And you know, the current thinking is every woman needs, every young person coming into a job needs a mentor. And uh, I know Hank Baggish and John Kay 
gave me really good advice, you should get on the curriculum committee because when you're on the curriculum committee you really understand what's going on in the college and then you know and now you should serve on this committee and don't you want to run for academic senate president? So they were, um, they were wonderfully supportive and helpful even as um, I got pregnant with the second child, which by the way, at the same time I was teaching women the social revolution in the women's history class, which kind of delighted my female students. Uh, my baby was born the end of uh, the spring semester. I think I went into labor the next to the last class that night, only missed the very last class, um, graded the final exams with the baby strapped to my chest. <laughs> so. Uh, that was also a very nice experience and they were really supportive and I was going to take two-thirds time the following year uh, while the baby was still young and they gave me good advice okay why don't you have your load this way because that'll work out very well for your schedule so they were both mentors and supporters who helped me understand college politics uh, who steered me in the right direction and I will be forever grateful to them I had gotten my teacher training at Harvard in a program that I think has been discontinued called the Masters of Arts in Teaching and I'd been uh, headed for a secondary school uh, career which was very helpful in terms of techniques other than lecturing. And then I went to UCSB as a graduate student, thought college teaching is lecturing, came here, taught it for my first adjunct uh, job as one, just teach, just lecturing. And then uh, there was a, lot, a big movement here for small, for very structured small group discussions, for how to, uh, how to present materials in such a way that you stimulated uh, um, critical thinking. And there was a very, uh, and then Merv Lane in the English department was giving workshops, faculty workshops on how to uh, conduct effectively small group discussions. And so I found that uh, wonderfully also supportive in terms of other faculty members experimenting with other ways of teaching and not just lecturing. Although I think the social science division tended to stick very much to formal lecturing, but in other departments and in some of the social science instructors also. One of the most important changes in terms of instruction for me was uh, when students began to uh, be given um, tests and guidelines as to, well, if you're test in English at this level, then you should not take such and such a course. Because when the first years I was teaching here, we would have barely literate students, and we're you're trying to teach a college, and yet you have to teach a college history class that is comparable to what they're getting at the university that permits them to transfer. And you're trying to prepare them to do that at the same, to make up for deficiency they've had in their past. So to have them go into the right English class first, to get some of those skills first, really was a huge help for those of us who were uh, teaching college level classes that required a fairly advanced level of both reading and writing. I didn't do much else except mother and work. <laughs> we didn't have a big outside social life because when we were, and my husband's a university professor, but also in a very difficult time of his career you know, with lots of publishing pressure. And he's a very conscientious teacher. So, uh, you know, even though you can say, well, we presumably have a flexible schedule. As a matter of fact, I tended to arrive at 8 in the morning when I could drop my children off at school or daycare and get back at 5 in the evening because I tried to compartmentalize. But even so, there was that nighttime grading after the children were in bed. So yeah, it was a tough juggling act, but I had a lot of... We had students come in after school and uh, they went to very good nursery schools and both of them survived and said that was just fine. There had been important changes a few years after when I saw Joe White in the philosophy department, then an adjunct, very young adjunct instructor in philosophy, come to school with his um, toddler on his back. And I'm not sure at this point whether he was just having office hours or what he did with the child while he was actually teaching classes. While I thought, now that's really the ultimate in women's liberation. The hope was that these, these courses would become sort of specialized courses because all the major surveys would include all this information. I think that has really been accomplished, that the major survey courses now do include a lot about women. I notice the textbooks that are being used in the history department are textbooks that are strong in including women's history. And yet that doesn't mean there isn't a need for these specialized courses as well. So I was really happy to see that development. The other thing that I'm very pleased to have been part of was the establishment of the honors program. And that was in the early 80s. Uh, a team of faculty worked together on that uh, cross-disciplinary. I 
think Rob, Bob Kassir has mentioned or will mention uh, his course on revolutions was part of that. Larry Friesen taught a course in the biology department. Janice um, Peterson began a course in the communications department. And the course I uh, started was another interdisciplinary course because I found I just found that very stimulating. So I uh, offered a course for the, specifically just for the honors program called uh, The Methods of Social Scientists. So I had speakers coming in from, all this, uh, from our social science disciplines, political science, psychology, sociology, philosophy, talking about uh, the methods in their particular field, which is wonderful for teaching critical thinking. And so this was a kind of seminar uh, atmosphere and very bright students, only about 20 at a time. The honors program is still alive and well. It's changed over the years. Uh, and I'm not sure they now have, I think they just have an honors section of the, field, of the courses that are offered already, rather than these specially tailored courses that I was teaching. I just have to say that uh, for me, City College was just the perfect fit. But given my training for secondary school, plus the specialized, uh, plus really in-depth study in my own field, um, I love teaching here. I love the excitement of the students. Marvelous uh, colleagues always. And uh, I regret nothing about my career at all. It's a great fit.